I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about what we're doing at Distance Lab. Distance Lab is um, trying to bring together technology, design, and the arts to overcome the disadvantages of distance in a whole range of domains. So for example, uh, telehealth and distance learning, uh, various cultural applications and uh, long distance relationships. So you'll see some examples of that coming out in my talk. Um, we do a little bit of academic research, but um, we're also trying to change the way academic research is done because academics are really incentivized by the government to publish to an audience of academics. So a lot of the ideas and uh, knowledge that's built up in academia never really reaches the, uh, the rest of the world, the sort of uh, industry and, and, and improves our lives as a result. So we're trying to change that and we're doing a lot of work with companies, uh, with uh, other organizations, taking on briefs, generating ideas, coming up with new product concepts and that kind of thing that we can commercialize with partners. Um, but anyway, the work I'm going to tell you about today is about trying to understand what communicating is going to be like in the future. So I'd like to start with this image, which is obviously not about communicating, but this is the top, or maybe the second top uh, image result on Google when you, when you try to Google fast food. Um, and I started to write down a list of things that kind of characterize fast food. For one thing, it's served to you in a very efficient way. It's all about getting the job done. It's anywhere, anytime. You can eat that food on the go while you're you know, walking down the street in your car or something like that. Uh, this, the Big Mac is supposed to taste the same anywhere in the world that you eat it and practice it probably doesn't, but um, it's also served to you in a very robotic way. Uh, it's very impersonal, it's very generic. So these are kind of you know, what characterize fast food. It's a, it's a, a particular phenomenon that's been uh, very well understood. But there's another way to experience food, and a lot of you might be familiar with this thing called the slow food movement. Is anybody not familiar with that? Um, and that's a different way of thinking about food where it's kind of the opposite in a way. Instead of efficiency, it's about the quality of the food. Instead of the same taste anywhere in the world, it's about using local ingredients and making the food somehow special uh, with local ingredients. And instead of the anywhere, anytime thing, you have to have it in a particular setting where everything about that setting has been controlled to maximize the, the benefits of the, of the experience or to maximize the, the, the experience in general. Um, it's also not something that's served to you very robotically. It's, it's something where you have more humanity and intimacy coming into the dining experience. So there's slow food, and it's a very interesting um, movement um, because it's a completely different design for food. And what I want to suggest to you is that the mobile phone is pretty much like fast food. Um, that the same design mentality that led to fast food has led to the mobile telephone. Um, and in that way, you can sort of see how it works. I mean, just like fast food is very generic, um, the, the phone is also very generic. You use the same phone to talk to your lover as you do to talk to your pizza man or your telemarketer or something like that. Why should that be? Um, the quality is not so good, but it's enough to get the job done. You can talk on that phone anywhere, anytime. So you can see it's a lot like fast food. Um, so, um, and it doesn't really matter what uh, phone you have either. It's sort of the same uh, phenomenon, if you ask me. <laughs> Um, so what I want to ask you then is what might slow communication be all about? And so I'm going to share with you a few examples of what I think slow communication can be just to inspire some different directions here. So the first um, area that uh, maybe slow communication uh, should uh, address is distractions. Maybe slow communication should be distraction-free. Um, and we actually had something like that in the past. It was the telephone box. Um, telephone booth that is what we call it in the States actually. You could go in there and you would have a sort of closed off environment for making a phone call. It was kind of slightly um, uh, at a distance from everything that's happening outside. You could still see what's outside but anyway you had a little contextually neutral space there to go into. So um, we sort of decided to take, oops, we, we decided to take that, uh, that idea to an extreme. And, and I'm going to show you a video of uh, what we came up with. And there's sound on this, so I don't know if we can get the sound piped up on that. Probably very loud.
Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm here. Okay, I just wondering if the, uh, is everything cool on your end? It feels really weird to be... Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we, uh, we decided to meet up. Yeah. It's been a long time. So what are you getting up to these days? Well, I'm living with a Spanish guy now. Really? Where about? Marianne, you can turn it down. I'll, I'll continue to narrate a little bit while this uh, continues to play. So this is a project that we did called the Isophone. It's like an isolation phone. And basically it's a combination of a telephone with a flotation tank. Um, so you, you put on a helmet. This helmet blocks out all of your vision. Uh, we float you in some water, and the, the water is the same temperature as your skin. So when you're in there, you can't feel anything. Uh, and also, you, you can't smell or taste anything. So all you have, it's like a complete sensory deprivation environment. All you have is the voice of another person who's doing something else, uh, doing the same thing somewhere else in the world. So um, that's the concept. And we actually, you know, the, the reason it has these three um, bulbs at the sides is so that it would actually float your head above the water so you could actually speak and breathe and that kind of thing. Um, and we actually went quite far with this. We built tanks that you could go in and have a phone call that way and it would be connected to a mobile phone <laughs> transmitter that would be um, kind of at the side here. So you could kind of imagine this as the extension of the telephone box. Instead of you know, going in there, you would put on your swimming trunks and dive in there and make a phone call and you wouldn't be able to dial the phone obviously in there. So we would have an operator outside who would listen to your instructions and dial the phone for you. So it's like a total service uh, that was there. And we actually went one step further with it um, to have a completely submersed one. So we got this um, mask that you wear. It's like the sort of scuba diving mask, uh, the same thing that Navy SEALs use so that they can breathe and speak at the same time. And then you have underwater, uh, underwater headphones, which have very high audio quality, so you're completely underwater now. It's in a very womb-like environment. So that may seem like a crazy experiment to you, um, but we actually learned a lot from that about how the form of a communication device can affect the kind of conversations that you have on it. And people did have very different conversations or kinds of conversations with this device than they did with a normal telephone. Um, and just to give you an example, some people lost track of time entirely. Some people were in there for half an hour and felt it was only five minutes. Other people were in there for five minutes and thought it was half an hour. Um, and people also gestured a lot more. And normally if you're, you have a phone, you might gesture with you know, one hand the most, but if you have all of your limbs free, then you're sort of going around, kicking around the thing as you're gesturing. So it was quite interesting to see how much people would actually gesture. Um, but the most interesting thing, I think, was that people had these sort of um, conversations that went on tangents when they, when they were in their conversation. So they, they'd follow one thing, because there was no sort of conversation anchor to keep you tied to one particular topic. So they would go off on tangents, and they thought that they were being more creative because of that. So we thought, oh, here's actually a phone that people can use to be more creative or something like that. Um, so we got to thinking, you know, if we can do that, then it might be possible to build a phone that, for example, causes two people to fall in love, or starts a war, you know, or causes people to die from laughter or something like that. So um, that's the isophone. That was work that was done by um, a couple of guys, James Auger and Jimmy Loiseau, um, back in Media Lab Europe, actually, where I was uh, before Distance Lab. Let's talk about another axis of um, slow communication that could be important, intimacy. Um, it seems like a lot of our communication devices uh, nowadays, including email, you know, instant messengers, things like that, really strip us of our intimacy. They sort of steal it away. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, we tried an experiment, which I'll show you another video for. This video can play at low volume, actually. I'll just uh, uh, tell you what it is. So this is um, an experiment that we made um, that's kind of like turning the mobile phone on its head again and imagining something completely different. In this case, it's meant to be used in a bedroom environment and it's meant to be used by two people who are in a long distance relationship. So one of the, uh, there's a girl here and a guy here and they're meant to be in different locations. You have to imagine it that way. And the interface is pretty much like um, a kind of body drawing. You can't see it very well in the video. The projection is not too bright, but they're lying in bed and they can, one person can pick up a ring that you can see there, a red thing and wear the ring um, there's a, a camera from above that can detect the location of that ring and he can basically draw 
lines on his body or on his bed surface. Those lines are transmitted to his girlfriend's bed somewhere else in the world, and they get projected onto her body, and she can respond in kind. She can also put on her ring and send lines back to him. So you have a kind of collaborative drawing that comes out. And we wanted it to be something that, you know, where, where the person isn't in the screen and caught in the screen, but where something is actually projected directly on your body. And if you draw in the same place at the same time, the color of the lines will change to red like that, just to signify that you were in synchrony with your partner at that moment in time. So it's, it's, a, it's an, a completely different communication system um, from a mobile phone, which is again very impersonal, very generic. Uh, like I said before, you use the same phone to talk to any sort of person uh, uh, as you do um, you know, to talk to uh, you know, your lover or a pizza man or whoever. Um, in this environment, it's about a specific relationship, a specific kind of relationship that's only um, to be used with this uh, communication device. So that's a project called Mutsugoto. It was created by Tomoko Hayashi, a Japanese artist who works with us. And again, it's just suggesting that communication doesn't have to steal away our intimacy like we sort of feel like it does now, but can actually be something that enhances it and is tailored to a relationship, in this case, a romantic relationship. OK, another axis of um, slow communication. Slow food, there's a lot of tradition in slow food, so maybe there should be tradition in slow communication as well. But a lot of technology nowadays doesn't really reflect our traditions. It's kind of hard-edged, it's black, it's sort of sport-focused, very male-focused in many cases. It doesn't have to really be like that necessarily. We could have technology that looks like this, where it's some kind of antique textile that's combined with high technology like LEDs or something like that. Um, and that's actually part of a piece that uh, Elena Corchero has made. She's made a collection of fashion accessories that are using very traditional textile techniques and embroidery techniques, but combining them with technology of various kinds. In this case, it's solar cells that are kind of um, sewn into this uh, antique looking fan, and they're wired together into this circuit board here, which is in the shape of one of the, the fan, uh, slats of the fan. And, uh, and they're wired together actually with conductive thread. So the solar cells will collect light and charge a battery that's part of that uh, circuit. And the way that's meant to be used is you would take it out during the day, uh, you know, and use it while you're hot outside or something like that. Uh, it charges the battery. And then at, at night, you bring it inside and you put it on your mantelpiece or something like that. And it makes a, a sort of colorful lighting display, like a little uh, lighting display in the background. And she's made other pieces like a necklace and a sort of hairpin. And this one is my personal favorite. It's a parasol that you can use outside during the day, collects energy. Then you bring it in at night and you hang it upside down and it becomes a chandelier. So it just kind of gives a little bit of a ambient glow to your room. So again, that's, oops, that's again just trying to suggest, I think, that technology doesn't have to be so hard-edged and ugly like that. It can actually be something that reflects our traditions and reflects our humanity. And then the last uh, axis of slow communication I'm going to talk about is this notion of being healthy. I mean, slow food is very healthy um, because it's made with good ingredients, but it also stimulates a healthy relationship between you and the other people that you're dining with. Um, so maybe slow communication should be the same kind of thing. And that's why we um, became very interested in sports. Um, sports is a great way to introduce people to each other. It's a great way to break the ice between people. Um, and it's a great way to, to build trust with other people as well. But the thing that always is true is that you have to be in the same physical location as the other person that you're playing sports with, as your you know, teammates or your competitors. So wouldn't it be great if we could take advantage of all of those good effects of sports, but over a distance and play sports games with other people who are in different locations? And that's exactly what we um, have been working on. Uh, we did a couple of other experiments in the past. Uh, one was a soccer one and a jogging one, but our, our latest and greatest one is a, a boxing over a distance game. And it's pretty hard to describe in a picture, so I'm gonna show you a video. Um, before the video starts playing, I'll just say that there's a mattress here that's stood up against a wall, and that has a video projection on it of that guy's opponent. And he basically has to go after that, that, uh, that shadow and hit it as hard as he can. You can turn up the sound a little bit if you want to. <laughs> 
So you have to imagine that there are two sites that are pretty much the same. He's in one of them, and his opponent is in another one. There's a camera that captures the silhouette and projects it onto the other uh, mattress. And then there's a matrix of sensors in there that knows exactly where he's hitting it and how hard he's hitting it. And you can basically uh, get points. And we kind of added these kind of Batman-esque uh, pows and misses in there so you can kind of know when you're making points. Here's another video, actually, just to show you. Uh, this guy was very aggressive, very angry for some reason. And uh, you could see that he was thinking about video games and the way fighting video games work and trying to duplicate those moves. You know, and, you know, he was playing two-on-two -two in that case, so it's uh, quite an interesting... Uh, you know, team effort, I guess, to destroy the other side. But, uh, but I think that was very interesting just because here were kids who, you know, came in to play this game, and a lot of them looked like they were sort of used to doing the, you know, the, the little controllers in front of their TVs all day long, and they come in and they see this, and it's like the favorite thing that they, they like to do, these, uh, these video games, but all of a sudden they can actually move around and punch something and become physically active, which is what kids actually want to do. So we were kind of combining those two things. And uh, we thought that would be a very interesting uh, type of installation to have in schools so that you could have uh, perhaps schools playing sports with other schools who are in different uh, locations, especially if you have schools in remote locations um, that can't get around to play sports as often as, uh, as they'd like to because of the cost of traveling. You could have that uh, built into schools, use it for other sort of learning applications, but you could also play sports with schools who are in you know, India or the United States or something like that. You have an interesting cultural experiences. Um, that's just a graphic of uh, what it uh, is sort of meant to be. It's like a boxing ring that you slice in half and you put a screen in the middle um, so that you can actually fight against the person. So again, that's, I think, trying to suggest how communication doesn't have to be a sort of sedentary experience. I mean, if you think about it, anytime you're communicating, whether it's on the phone or email, you're probably sitting down. You're not doing a lot of moving around. And it doesn't have to be that way. Communication can be something that actually makes you physically active and makes you healthy, not just physically healthy, but actually stimulates maybe a better relationship between you and the person you're communicating with because of that. Oh, there's come a few more pictures. Little kid, uh, I like that one actually. Look like Popeye. So um, that's pretty much it actually. This is a kind of recap of the um, um, axes, I guess you could say, of the slow communication space. And I hope I've convinced you that this is an interesting area to be uh, looking into, or at least it's one that uh, maybe will grow in importance over time, just as slow food has certainly grown in importance. Um, maybe slow communication will, will grow in importance and we'll get away from the sort of uh, communication burger that we all are now using. So thank you very much.